Nishida, like, question as the new <laughs> Deloitte Innovation Officer, what are we doing? Yeah. What new things have you come up with? What are we working on? You know, when I took this role, uh, some of the asks from our leadership was, really, what should innovation mean for us at Deloitte? What could we do from the center that would better enable you to serve our clients? And a lot of the conversation was, help us understand how to connect to the external ecosystem, right? What does that mean? Startups, new technology players, right? Niche technology players that will help us develop new sets of solutions we can bring to market. Hello, good afternoon, good morning. My name is Robert Schmidt, also known as Mr. IoT. I am Deloitte's chief IoT technologist, and I have a deep passion for all things digital. Today, my guest is Nishita Henry. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. You are our chief innovation officer. I don't know how long have you been in this role? Yeah, just about six months now. So six it's months. been innovative <laughs> for the last six months. And before that, you led our uh, federal technology practice, That's correct? right. That's right, about 3,000 practitioners serving all branches of the U.S. government. That's awesome. And we are recording this actually at uh, the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas. So from an innovation perspective, what have you seen? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the innovations you're excited about. Well, I'd say, one, it's just such an amazing and impressive show given the breadth of technologies that are covered and the breadth of companies that come, right? All the way from your you know, startups that have tables to your large organizations that bring you know, yachts into the building. So it's truly the spectrum. Um, I think the, the coolest things I've seen uh, that are going to impact our business, one, is the 5G network. Right, so all of our major network carriers are here, your AT&T's, your Verizon's, your Qualcomm's, all here kind of demonstrating the power of 5G, right? And you talk about, you know, Mr. IoT, as you well know, right, 5G is revolutionary, I think, to the IoT market. From a latency, from a, you know, bandwidth opportunity, from a connectivity opportunity, um, just being able to have devices really talk with one millisecond of latency is amazing, right? What it can do to help transform medical devices, what it can help to do to transform autonomous vehicles um, is revolutionary. We're not there yet, right? I mean, we still have some ways to go. They're just launching. It's gonna continue to develop. Um, I think that was one really interesting area. The other interesting area was around the connected home, right? You had, uh, you know, Procter & Gamble's and you had your LG's and everyone here with their smart devices, um, with devices that you, know, you talk to your TV and it could tell your washing machine to start. One of the other cool things LG had was those curved TVs. I don't know if you went oh, you and like saw those? that. It was spectacular, beautiful, beautiful, it, totally immersive. Um, able to roll, right? You can roll your TV away. Um, you can put it up as a display. Um, so that technology was really interesting too. Awesome. Did you see any interesting startups? Any interesting particular Internet of Things startups that you thought, yeah. wow, that's going to really change business? And so life? some of the startups I've talked to, a lot of them are around the mobility space, right? And so some of them were around, you know, um, so autonomous vehicles, but different types of technology to enable that. So some had like autonomous pickup trucks, and then some of it was around the battery storage technology, because that is one thing that has not evolved over time the way we thought it would, right? Batteries batteries and the ability to store energy, right? And the ability to do it in smaller devices over longer periods of time. So I think that's like the next new innovations to come. I didn't see anything really cool in that area just yet. Interesting. I actually had a really fun experience when I was here the last time in Vegas. I was standing outside the hotel and I ordered myself um, a ride share. Mm -hmm. And it popped up with this message. We have a self-driving car that will pick you up. Yes. Are you okay with that? I was like, yes, yes, <laughs> yes, please. And it was really a fascinating experience. Did you go on it? I did, yeah. Yeah? So I have was you ever done it? it? No. It was funny. Rob and I were ordering one today. I ordered a lift and it gave me the option. The problem was it didn't come to you directly. You had to walk to some other location to get it. So given the timing in the morning, I said, forget it. I'm not going to try it. I have to get oh, something so you declined. it picks me up. <laughs> Next time I'm going to do it purposefully because I want to be able to experience it. I thought it was... So first of all, I said absolutely yes. They could have had me walk another half a mile to get on yeah. it because I was so fascinated yeah. by it. It would look like a regular BMW. It had like these radar things underneath the mirrors. 
And then the thing was, they told me I can't have as many passengers mm. because they actually had a person sit in the passenger seat with a laptop. And really all they did was answer my questions the whole time. Uh. And they were taking notes and so forth. And the driver was sort of driving for actually a good part. I was almost disappointed how little self-driving the car did. Interesting. But anyhow, it was a really fascinating car. They allowed me to take pictures from the outside, yeah. not from the inside. And it was really, I was like, wow, this is going to be cool. You know, you got to start somewhere. So that's great. So you talked a little bit about 5G and latency. Mm -hmm. I, I read somewhere someone talked about the G's every 10 years we have a new G so we had 4G now we have 5G yep. when are we gonna actually see 5G me you as yep. well as in the industrial IoT when are we gonna really see it used yeah I think we're we're coming up on 2020 right I think they've already uh, you know announced launch cities it's funny as somebody and one of the um, here in Vegas was saying the the 5G kind of antennas have already been starting to be placed around the city right and they have to be placed in a certain number of distance it's not like the big antennas and the big towers so um, one, it's going to require a lot of you know physical infrastructure to be put in place to enable 5G. Over time, that'll change as technology continues to adopt. But I think by 2020, we're going to start actually seeing it, right? I think in 2019, smaller networks are going to get it as proofs of concepts, um, and and smaller areas are going to get it to understand kind of how do we work with it, how to um, you know equipment work with it, because you're not going to just have 5G. You're going to have to have the equipment to be able to get onto the 5G networks. So. Can we talk a little bit about federal? Yeah. Uh, quite timely. Let's talk about technology. I think you and I said we can talk about uh, airport security a little bit. Uh, we're doing work in this area. What work are we doing? And uh, yeah. tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so one, we do amazing work for our government. And I, I will say um, I have served our government for the last 20 years of my career, right? Um, and our government is here to serve us as citizens, which is why I am so passionate about the work we do, because I think it is impactful to all of us who live here in the States and abroad. Um, we do things like digital experiences for transportation. We do things like cloud uh, movement for big manufacturing, right? You didn't think the government manufactures? They manufacture all our currency, right? Putting them into the cloud. And actually that 10 years ago was one of the first places we were using IoT. We put sensors on the printing devices to actually measure temperature control, uh, to measure um, humidity, right? In order to improve the quality of currency being, being produced. So we've done a lot of stuff long time ago, starting with IoT before it was even called IoT. <laughs> they were just called sensors back then. Um, you mentioned airport security. We do a lot of work for our Transportation and Security Administration. Um, we help them all the way from back office uh, HR systems and finance systems to talking about airport security, right? We were there helping them think about the pre-check processes and how to mitigate risk. Um, they've had a program in place for a long time around how do they connect all their security devices. Right? How do they improve the ability to manage them, to maintain them, um, and to upgrade them over time without having to physically go out to the machine every single time to do that? Right? And so we've been talking to them and advising them around techniques uh, to be able to enable that. Are you a TSA pre and clear Absolutely. customer? You do both? <laughs> I do both, 100%. Best thing I ever did. I never thought I needed clear, but I will tell you after having it, I could never go back. What do you do with the bad looks people give you when you walk by them? It's like, I love clear, except every time I go like this, you know? It's like people look at you weird when you cut in line at TSA Listen, break. Listen, you know, you paid for the service. That's what you get. Sorry. <laughs> and the best part about it is, like, you never take your license out, right? It uses all biometrics. Um, and it's a funny story. I, I did it. Reagan National has clear, always gone through it. I was doing a day trip to New York. Then you go to LaGuardia. Um, and I realized after I got to LaGuardia, I had left my driver's license in my purse at home from over the weekend. LaGuardia does not have clear in that terminal. So you changed the airports. Well, I was, I was like flipping out. I was like, what am I going to do? How do I do this? Looking on the TSA site to figure out what the alternatives are. The best part is I realized I had a federal government issued ID from the Food and Drug Administration because I've done work from there and they accept that as a legal um, you know, identification. So it was fantastic, but it was definitely one of those things. If you have clear, always still make sure you have your license because you never know <laughs> where, what the next airport has. So it's interesting, if I remember this right, um, actually we were a big part of creating TSA Pre mm -hmm. and there's a lot of data analytic, analytics and stuff that goes behind that. How much can we talk about this? What can you tell us about this? Because it's an interesting yeah. um, uh, use case. Yeah, you know, I um, I don't know as much about it, so I don't know exactly kind of what the data was and how we used it. I, I, I know what we really did was work through the governance and work through kind of 
the approach and the strategy for rolling it out and the concept behind it, right? Why you should have it, what it should be. Um, the data and analytics around, you know, how do you figure out who can be trusted and who cannot, right? Um, obviously was a big part of it, but some of it was, um, you know, done by TSA itself. But we do a lot of work around risk management for the TSA, right? In terms of trying to take vast amounts of data and integrate that in a way that we can connect the dots, right? That's very hard to do in traditional relational databases. You got to use new technologies like graph databases um, in order to actually understand, hey, who is Nishida? And what were the last five phone calls that she might have made? And who might those people be connected to? And what were those people connected to? And where did those people go? You know, so there's a lot of that data connectivity challenges that we've been helping them solve, not necessarily around pre-check, but around a whole host of security issues. I Actually, it puts it really close to me because mm -hmm. you might not know this, but uh, uh, I have an airline as a client, and we did work with them around how to, um, what is the wait time at TSA? Mm -hmm. So we placed beacons in an airport for uh, an innovation purpose, and we tracked how long does it take people to get through and how many lines and so forth. And so um, it's quite interesting to work with the airline, which is sort of like yeah. the other side of this. Yeah. And so it'd be interesting for me to hear a little bit about where's the handoff between the two because you worked with TSA, I worked for the airline. Yeah. How do they work together from your point of view? Yeah, so we work with a lot of consortiums actually that not only talk to TSA, but the airport, the airline, but there's also the airport. The airport is a different yeah, authority, exactly. right? So you have so many players in this ecosystem that you really have to bring together. And and we've always had the saying: if you've seen one airport, you've seen one airport. <laughs> every airport's <laughs> different. Um, you know, every state's different. Every locality is different um, in terms of kind of the way the airport's set up, how they manage their operations, etc. So can you pick your favorite, or is that not really appropriate? Well, I pick my favorite just as a traveler. It's Reagan National, hands down. I, I can't even say enough great things because one, it's so close to my house but two you can be from door to gate in less than three minutes no lie like it's just such a great airport um, and it's so close make to a city. competition between love field and oh there Reagan, you go so I don't know <laughs> yeah, well, I actually really have not think I've ever flown into love field I always fly into uh, Dallas what's the other airport there it's called oh, oh Dallas Houston. Fort Worth Dallas Fort Worth I always fly to Dallas Fort Worth yeah love field has a nice flair they play music uh, there very it's nice. kind of like I don't know I'm going more about flair but yeah I'm sorry okay. to interrupt you <laughs> That's okay. I love it. But, you know, we work a lot. You know, actually, I think one of the engagements we did, our TSA team partnered with one of our airline teams in order to actually talk through the airline wait time piece, right? And how do they actually measure it? How do they use IoT devices and sensors to do that, et cetera? So there's a true partnership that has to happen between all of those players in order to improve the entire customer experience. The airports themselves are in competition with each other, so they have an imperative, right, to actually want to improve the customer experience for a lot of reasons. One, get more people in and out, gets more money in their pockets because there's more people shopping in their stores, there's you know more people buying the things that the airport's trying to sell, so they have an imperative to want to make the experience better. Airlines have an imperative to make the experience better because they do have competition, right? Um, and, and frankly, TSA does too because they have a finite budget and a finite workforce as well, right? And they need to make sure we're protected adequately. So there's a lot of great synergies along the, along the um, lines of all of them. Nishida, question as the new <laughs> Deloitte Innovation Officer, uh, what are we doing? Yeah. What new things have you come up with? What are we working on? Great. I'm glad you asked. Um, you know, when I took this role, uh, some of the asks from our leadership was really what should innovation mean for us at Deloitte? Right? And I did a lot of conversations with our you know, leaders around our offering portfolios, around our sectors and industries, around what could we do from the center that would better enable you to serve our clients. And a lot of the conversation was, help us understand how to connect to the external ecosystem. Right? What does that mean? Startups, new technology players, right? niche technology players that will help us develop new sets of solutions we can bring to market. Right, um, And so to that end, what we're doing is we are taking the model we've used in Israel, in Tel Aviv, two years ago when we established the innovation tech terminal there, and we are establishing that same model in Silicon Valley, and we're extending it. So we are going to have a full-time team in the Valley actually dedicated to forming relationships with startups around five different domains that are specific to us, either aligned to a signature issue or an industry. I hope it's IoT. IoT will obviously be part of it. Future mobility is part of it, right? All of those things kind of go together. Um, so we're going to be doing that, and we're extending that to having incubating capabilities in specific domains that will enable us to, one, identify the right use cases where our clients are challenged, and identify a set of technologies that we can add our IP on top of, and we can prototype new solutions to take to market. 
right? So really excited about sensing and incubating, and we're launching this as Deloitte Catalyst officially in February. So stay tuned for um, our uh, rollout. I'm curious. We I, I know that as part of this conversation is always the question of what's private, what's not. Um, I'm curious how do you, how would we deal with it with our federal agencies and I'm always curious yeah. also to hear about how do you feel about privacy personally because I think it's an interesting comparison yeah. with generational changes we feel differently and so forth. Yeah, that's true. Generationally we do feel differently. I'll just tell you, I personally believe everybody's got all my information anyway. I, I do. Right? We put it out there. I have a Facebook account. I have an Instagram account. I bank online. Right? I you know, buy things online. It's all out there. I um, hope to be able to say that the organizations that have that data are protecting it adequately. And I believe for the most part everyone does the best they can. But I believe inevitably it will be retrieved by somebody we don't want it to be. Because that is just the fact of how we live today. Right? Um, but I do believe there are certain parts of and pieces of data that should remain purely private, right? Whether it's your healthcare data, right? Whether it's your own personal financial data, those aren't things that you know we should share and we should have out in the public domain. Um, I think that privacy, security, regulatory compliance are all incredibly important, and we can't think of it as an afterthought, right? It has to be built and designed in upfront, and it has to be part of that design process. And too often, we kick it the can down the road, and therefore they become a business, um, you know, hindrance as opposed to a business enabler. I, and when I think of privacy, I often think about people talk about location. Since mm -hmm. my project was mostly about location services and where you are when, um, I I always say, you know. If I don't want to know where I'm at, there's something not really, there's something not going on that I shouldn't really think about anyhow. So I really don't mind if people know where I'm at. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I find interesting in these projects is that sometimes you don't even know how people feel about certain settings yeah. and so forth. So what do you do about these things where you go into, you, you're an innovation, right? You yeah. go into new areas. How do you go about this when you actually don't know how people kind of feel yeah. about privacy? Well, I think you have to use it as part of the design process again, right? When you think about design thinking and human-centered design, I think you have to ask those questions up front, right? And you have to make people get people more educated. And I genuinely believe the more educated they are, the more informed decisions people make around that, and the more they understand, right, what is good or what is it bad, right? And as opposed to living in a world of fear, we should live in a world of hope, right? What do you get for providing your location information as opposed to what do you lose. Um, uh, and so there's just a different way of going about that, I think, that we can do better. I almost want to close on the thought of living in a world of hope, yeah. but I want to ask you one more question in terms of um, what, what did you not see here that you're looking forward to the next year, mm -hmm. the next three years? What are these innovations that you really want to strive for as the Chief Innovation Officer of Deloitte? Yeah. So what did I hope to see? You know, it's interesting. A lot of these tech are still nascent, meaning they're not really ready for scale at enterprise yet, right? You talk about things like blockchain, which I think is a revolutionary technology, and I believe that so many major organizations are um, doing some trial and error with right now and are trying to pilot, right? I think in the next two to three years, it will become like the internet, right? And maybe not two to three years, maybe five to six years, but it will be the new transaction mechanism. So I would love to see more and more happening in, in that space. Um, even further down the road, quantum computing. Right? I mean, that will revolutionize right? how, we, how much data we can process and what we can do with that data. And that's still far down the road because that's just the laws of physics and really understanding how do we bend to the laws of physics, right? Um, and so that's still down the road in terms of kind of what's coming up in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Um, other things like you know, the use of AI. Um, AI right now right, is still not in a place where it can uh, learn it from, from itself fast enough, right? You still need a human. Like, an AI could beat you at chess, but if you change the chessboard or change one or two of the rules of the game, it can't beat you anymore, right? Because it doesn't know how to adapt to it. So over time, that AI is going to be able to figure out how to adapt. But I think there's other things we got to think of, right? What are the ethical implications? What are the you know, you know, moral implications of some of this technology? And I don't think we can forget about that. And I think we have to have deliberate discussions, right, that I don't see us as technologists doing enough of yet. Looks like our coffee chat is coming to an end. Um, Thank you for watching. Nishita, thank you so much for being here. This was a fascinating conversation, and um, you're going to stay around for CES a little longer? I'm taking the red eye home tonight. Got to get back to Reagan, my favorite airport. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here. And if you missed any part of the show uh, today or any past shows, please go and check out uh, my YouTube channel where you can see any of the previous shows. And with that, thank you so much for watching.